Good afternoon. We, good morning. We start with general questions. Question number one, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many problem drug users there are. Cabinet Secretary, Ken McCaskill. The latest figures from ISD, Information Services Division of Scotland, published on 28 October 2014, estimate that between April 2012 and March 2013, the number of individuals with problem drug use in Scotland aged from 15 to 64 was 59,500. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The 2015-16 Justice Draft Budget sets out the Scottish Government's plans to spend £32.7 million tackling drug misuse. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what proportion of this money will be spent on opioid replacement therapy, what proportion will be spent on rehabilitation, and how much of the health budget is targeted at drug misuse? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we target as much as we can. I don't think I can give her the precise answer and percentages, but I'm happy to write to her to ensure she gets that appropriate information. Obviously, the whole government strategy that's been built up, not simply by my ministerial colleague, Rosanna Cunningham, but previously by Fergus Ewing, who championed it, is the road to recovery. It's about meeting with the needs of the individual drug user, what issues they face. We do have significant problems, obviously, with opiate. Uh, equally, as we try to move people on to methadone, we have issues there that we've addressed as a parliament. And we know that actually a growing issue now, uh, perhaps uh, certainly for a generational shift, is with uh, uh, the new psychological uh, substances that we have. So I'm happy to write to the member to give her the uh, uh, precise answers, because that statistic's not there. Uh, but it's about meeting the needs and the challenges that are changing. We are seeing progress, as uh, perhaps a coterie of older ones with opiate issues uh, have challenges. Drug use is down with regard to youngsters. Equally, NPS has come and is facing us and challenging us all. Margaret Rich. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of what appears to be an increasingly high incident of cannabis farms being discovered in Lanarkshire, Sex, Central Scotland and elsewhere? And given this is almost certainly indicative of rising demand, what action is the Government taking to address this specific point? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the specific point is that this is serious organised crime. These in the main tend not to be individuals having one pot or whatever. It's uh, done on an almost industrial scale, whether it's in Lanarkshire or elsewhere. Uh, that is why within Police Scotland we have the uh, specialist crime unit uh, who are seeking to tackle this, to raise awareness, to make sure that we try and work out who's dealing with it. Uh, some of it, as I say, relates to people who have been brought here to a uh, create farms. Some of it is about raising awareness with those who are involved in letting properties where action should be taken. But what I can give the members the assurance is that Police Scotland take this most seriously, uh, whether it's in Lanarkshire or elsewhere, and it is about tackling serious organised crime uh, before the issues that can follow in terms of the drug supply into our community. Question number two, John Mason. Hey, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on Glasgow City Council's decision to award a house in multiple occupation licence to the Belgrove Hotel and whether it considers this as an appropriate level of regulation for a building housing over 140 people. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. The purpose of licensing homes in multiple occupation is to ensure the safety of those who share accommodation with multiple occupants. It's not unusual for an HMO licence to be granted to a large establishment such as a hotel or a student halls of residence. Uh, obviously, the Belgrave, uh, Belgrove Hotel raises particular issues about the best way to address some of the more complex needs of those who are at risk of homelessness and who might not be as engaged uh, with services as others are. Uh, Margaret Burgess met with Glasgow City Council to discuss this particular issue earlier in the year and the Government and Glasgow City Council are continuing to work together to find appropriate and sustainable solutions which will help the residents of the Belgrove Hotel and I'm happy to ensure that the member is kept up to date with the progress of that work. John Mason. Thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I just wonder if she understands the frustration that in the year 2000 the BBC did a huge documentary on how awful the Belgrove Hotel was and we are now in 2014 and it is still awful. Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely understand uh, the member's frustration. Uh, I think, with the greatest respect to the member, more importantly than that, I understand the seriousness of the issues that were uncovered by the BBC and the importance of making sure that we as government work with the council who are in prime position here 
to ensure the safety uh, of people in the Bell Grove Hotel and to look at alternative solutions for them. Um, that is what we are determined <coughs> to continue to do. I want to uh, reassure John Mason that the Government is continuing to work with the Council to find a solution to what is a, a complex issue. And I think we also need to understand uh, some of the complexities of it. But I am more than happy to uh, ask Margaret Burgess to meet with John Mason to bring him up to date with the work that is ongoing and to repeat the undertaking I gave him in my initial answer uh, to keep him regularly posted as that work progresses. Question three, Mark Macdonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that disabled people and their families are able to access cultural and leisure opportunities. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that disabled people in Scotland are able to enjoy a wide range of leisure and cultural opportunities on the same basis as people without a disability. Our obligations to improve accessibility are set out in international treaties and domestic legislation, and we have committed to a range of specific actions which are now being implemented. We recognise that we need to do more uh, to remove barriers that prevent disabled people from participating, and we are working with uh, people with a disability to develop a draft disability delivery plan, which will be published for consultation in the spring of next year. Mark Macdonald. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, part of access to venues includes uh, being comfortable while visiting and experiencing them. Um, Many venues have changing places toilets in Scotland, but I am advised by a number of parents that uh, two venues, the Museum of Scotland and the Hydro, both uh, either recently refurbished or recently constructed, do not have these available, and that impedes on the enjoyment for many disabled people and their families. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary might meet with me to discuss how we can ensure that popular attractions in Scotland uh, can be enjoyed by individuals with disabilities and their families by having the appropriate facilities available to ensure that they can enjoy them. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, we, we are aware that the, the lack of suitable changing facilities and toilets in the community is a, a, a problem in preventing people with uh, profound and multiple uh, disabilities from going out and about and, of course, can increase social isolation. Uh, the member may be aware that uh, last year Michael Ma Matheson, the Minister for Public Health, launched the Keys to Life and announced funding of over £5 million to implement that strategy. And that recommended that the number of changing places toilets be increased in Scotland to 100 by June 2015. I'm able to be able be pleased to be able to advise uh, the, the member that we've been working with partners to take this forward and that the 100th changing place toilet will be opened on the 9th of December uh, of this year. However, we recognise very much that there's more that needs to be done and I'm happy to meet with the member as requested to see what more can be done. Richard Simpson. Um, I wonder if the minister is aware of the fact that, the, that our, our Ewan's Guide, which is a developing website for access by disabled people to all sorts of venues, will be celebrating its first anniversary at the beginning of December. And I wonder if she'd join with me in congratulating those who have developed Ewan's Guide and all members of the public who are giving information to that guide in developing a site which tells people if there is good access or not. Cabinet Secretary. I'm very happy to, to join with uh, Richard Simpson in, uh, in doing so and uh, in uh, congratulating those behind Ewan's Guide. And, uh, I think it is very important that that information is out there. and uh, It is obviously a good source of information for people. I am very happy to, to endorse it and support it. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, both ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with all Health Board Chief Executives. Neil Bibby. The Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary made a lot uh, of comments during the referendum about protecting the NHS from privatisation. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what is his view on the decision by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to award a contract uh, aimed at tackling obesity to the US private company Weight Watchers? Cabinet Secretary. The presenting officer, uh, first of all, can I point out the Auditor General's report last week indicated that the amount of money spent in the private sector by the Health Service in Scotland went down last year and it remains at 0.84 per cent of the entire budget, which is what it was in the last year of the last administration. And like the previous administration, where we don't have a particular capacity or expertise in the National Health Service in Scotland, we buy that additional capacity in, as happened in this case. There's a big difference between buying in additional capacity you don't have and privatising existing facilities, which is what's happening south of the border. 
Question number five, Colin Keir. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has carried out a joint traffic assessment with the City of Edinburgh Council regarding long-term pressures on the three main, main western road approaches to the city. Minister Keith Brown. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with local authorities and key resilient stakeholders to improve the resilience of Scotland's roads network. Transport Scotland are currently undertaking a study with key stakeholders, including the City of Edinburgh Council, to assess the transport impacts of development proposals in the CES Plan Strategic Development Plan area. And that study includes the three main western road, road approaches to the city. The study will take cognizance of the benefits of the Edinburgh to Glasgow Improvement Programme and the new Edinburgh Gateway Station in the Gogar area of the city, which will be delivered in December 2016. And these will provide relief to road traffic in the west of Edinburgh through provision of enhanced connectivity, capacity and reduced rail journey times. Network Rail recently announced a £250 million contract award for the electrification of the main Edinburgh to Glasgow rail route. Colin Keir. I thank the Minister for his answers. It is clear that the traffic congestion in the west of Edinburgh is at critical levels at present, as we wait to see any benefits from the trams. Will the Minister agree to meet with me following the publication of the joint study with the City of Edinburgh Council in order to discuss its findings and possible future actions? Minister. I uh, am more than happy to meet the member. As I have mentioned already, the work that we are undertaking in relation to the tram interchange and also the work on Egypt, uh, plus other infrastructure works, seek to help the flow of traffic into uh, and out from Edinburgh. But I uh, am more than happy to meet the member as soon as the study becomes available publicly. Question 6, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what safeguards are in place to ensure that sex offenders are appropriately rehoused. Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill. Uh, the National Accommodation Strategy for Sex Offenders forms part of the multi-agency public protection arrangements. It provides a national framework for housing sex offenders in the community. Under the strategy, housing providers, social work, the prison service and the police work closely together, sharing information to assess the risks sex offenders pose and to find accommodation for the offender that allows these authorities to manage the risks. Jackson <coughs> uh, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the coverage following the recent local media exposure of a convicted paedophile in Barhead in my west of Scotland region. An individual has described those assigned to monitor him as fools and his strategy as being to tell these people what they like to hear. Nevertheless, I suspect the Cabinet Secretary and I will share misgivings about revealing the location of individuals in any sensationalist way. Can I, though, invite him to associate himself with the assurances of Chief Inspector Angela Carty, who has moved to reassure the public in East Renfrewshire regarding the monitoring of sex offenders. Can I ask him what more he can say about the review announced by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland and the Care Inspectorate regarding the effectiveness of the multi-agency public protection arrangements? And finally, can I welcome his announcement of an expert working group to test GPS technology, something Scottish Conservatives have been encouraging since 2007, and ask him when he expects the fruits of this to be deployed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank the member for that? There's quite a significant number of questions. I'd be happy to meet with him at some stage if he wanted a, a greater briefing. In 2015, the Care Inspector in Scotland, in conjunction with the HM Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, will undertake a joint review to assess the efficiency and effectiveness of MAPA. Its review will report and findings in late 2015, so we're underway on that. With regard to GPS tracking, I know that this is an issue that Mr Carlaw and indeed others uh, throughout the Chamber have raised. Uh, we do see merit and benefits in it. I think it would be fair to say we're going out to consult yet again because the technology is not quite there able to satisfy us that it will provide the security and safety that we want. We do know that it offers great opportunities, but I think we have to ensure that whatever opportunities it provides will in fact also give us the reassurance. So what I can say is in terms of MAPA, we're going out to review and we're happy to discuss with them and that will come back in the latter part of next year. And with GPS, we continue to work to ensure uh, that the progress technology has made that we're all aware in our mobile phones or whatever can provide the security and reassurance that we all require. Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Under the MAPA arrangements, the Cabinet Secretary is aware that a released sex offender will most likely be rehoused in the council area where they last resided and, unfortunately, perhaps where the crime was committed and will recall the difficulties in the Robert Green case in Midlothian. Is there room to review these housing provisions, particularly when it's a very small council area and people can be identified. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I can give the member the assurance that that is what is in fact done in common with other offenders. The registered sex offenders will generally return to their own communities unless there are exceptional circumstances, which means this will in 
increase the risk. One of the reasons is that one of the ways in which we can try and ensure that somebody is less likely to reoffend is that they've got a home to go to, some individuals who might very well care for them. And there's good reason to I believe that going back to where there is some perhaps a greater continuity of care and some friendship, then they may be less likely to reoffend. There may be good reason, whether it's about the safety of the community, the nature of the offence, that would mitigate against that. And that's why, as I say, these things are done on a multi-agency basis, as I referred to with Mr uh, Carlaw, to try and ensure that we balance the rights of the offender to be able to try and keep himself in the straight and narrow, having served his time and being what, under whatever additional arrangements may be through SOPA or OLRs, equally providing security and safety for a community, especially when we know we have challenging individuals uh, who can cause great harm and danger. Question 7, Jo McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Scottish Woodlaw Association submission to the Smith Commission that full powers over forestry should be devolved to this Parliament. Cabinet Secretary, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, the Member, I know, will recall the positive debate on woodlots in the Parliament last year and the support the Scottish Government is giving to the Scottish Woodlots Association. As the Association's submission to the Smith Commission points out, forestry in Scotland is already a devolved matter. Uh, however, there are other issues raised by the SWA, such as tax, that can have significant impacts on forestry and yet remain reserved to the UK Parliament. The Scottish Government has called for the Scottish Parliament to full fiscal responsibility in order to increase the democratic and financial accountability of the Scottish Parliament to the people of Scotland and also to allow the Parliament to use tax powers in a targeted way to pursue specific policy objectives, including, of course, those which support forestry. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Given that biomass has become one of the fastest growing markets for Scottish forestry, with planned new energy generating plants in Scotland and the rest of the UK um, that could con consume all Scottish timber production quite easily, does she agree with me that this necessitates the full devolution of energy policy to Scotland in order to deal with this demand in a way that suits our forestry industry? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Joe McAlpine will be aware, the Scottish Government has already put in place a cap on the size of new biomass electricity only plants in Scotland, and we've done that under the renewables obligation to promote the most carbon beneficial use of our forestry resource. Uh, as I indicated in my initial answer, we've set out our proposals for further devolution in the submission we made to the Smith Commission, and that includes having greater responsibility for energy policy and regulation, and that would include additional powers to tailor support for low carbon and renewable generation so that we can deliver Scottish priorities in a cost-effective way within a single energy market uh, and, of course, have joint oversight over uh, the UK energy regulator, Ofgem. Question number eight, Gil Patterson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on uh, whether defence is following the launch of the Ready for Winter campaign. Minister Keith Brown. Yeah, the Government continues to work closely with councils and stakeholders to improve the resilience of Scotland's weather defences and to ensure robust resilience arrangements are in place. Uh, the Ready for Winter campaign raises awareness of the risks from all kinds of severe weather, its consequences and the simple steps that people can take to prepare themselves. So I would encourage people to sign up to the tools such as Floodline and consult the Traffic Scotland website when planning to travel. Uh, the Transport Scotland Winter Service has been enhanced again this year with new trunkload operating company contracts across the whole of Scotland, meaning roads and pavements will be treated even more quickly than before. Gil can I thank the Minister for that statement? I, I know, Minister, that you will be coming to Parliament and make a full statement this, uh, this afternoon on this very matter. But in the meantime, can I ask what assurances have been received from local authorities, or authorities that their preparations for the winter period are ready for extreme adverse conditions? Minister. Uh, councils uh, work with responder partners in the voluntary sector and community councils, and they have a vital role to play in preparing for the many impacts that severe weather can have on individuals and communities. Uh, and we liaise very closely with our council colleagues in our winter planning work, and I was delighted to be joined by COSLA President, Councillor David O'Neill, uh, who joined me at the launch of the Ready for Winter campaign last month. The Government's resilience team has been in contact with all local authorities through the local and regional resilience partnerships. We have received assurances that detailed winter preparation 
plans are well established across the country. In terms of one specific area, uh, road clearing, Scotland's 32 local authorities are responsible for the maintenance and safe operation of Scotland's local road network. And each council is responsible for all aspects of the non-trunk road network within their jurisdiction, including winter service operations. It might be useful to mention, presiding officer, there is an amber warning out today for Aberdeenshire, Dumfries and Galloway, Ayrshire, Argyll and Butte, Central Tayside, Fife, Stirling and Perth and Kinross in relation to heavy rain. Thank you for the warning, Minister. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. <laughs> to ask the First Minister.